Let us pray. Gracious God, we give you thanks for this day of celebration, this day of gathering with your Holy Spirit present and moving in and among and through each and every one of us. I ask that this morning, either because of me or in spite of me, that you bring a message to your people. In Jesus' name, amen. So I have the dubious task this morning of trying to tie together Pentecost, Confirmation, and Memorial Day. Anybody want to try? You can come <laughs> to this for me, but I think I've done it. I think I've done it, so we'll see how it goes. So I was born into a family that has a very long history of military service for our country. So Memorial Day has always had significant importance to each of us because we've had family members that have served. We've known of people that have paid the ultimate sacrifice for the protection of our families, our communities, and our country. So that's always had significance uh, for each and every one of us. Memorial Day started a little bit after the Civil War, and it was actually called Decoration Day. And people would gather together and go and decorate the graves of fallen soldiers. Um, After World War I, uh, the serving together of both soldiers from the North and soldiers from the South uh, bridged the gap that had been formed during the Civil War. And the name was changed to Memorial Day instead of Decoration Day. And people would go out to decorate the graves of all the fallen soldiers. And that continues uh, to this day. When I think of Memorial Day, uh, one of the scenes uh, from a movie that comes to mind, I always think in movie images and scenes and stuff like that, but one of the most powerful ones for me is from the movie Saving Private Ryan. And if you've seen that movie, you know how powerful the movie is, but the scene that hit me the hardest, that brought me to tears and broke me was at the very end. Um, Just to give you an idea, if you haven't seen the movie, the premise is there was a a soldier in World War II. He had several brothers that were serving at the same time. All his brothers had died, and he was the sole surviving son. Uh, The president didn't want another entire family uh, wiped out and sent a team of soldiers in to find this young man uh, and bring him out. And many on that team paid the ultimate sacrifice just in pulling him out of the combat situation to send him home to his mother. So they found Private Ryan, they they pulled him out, um, and fast forward many years, he's standing at the grave of the leader of that team that came to get him, that died in the process of saving him. He's looking at the grave and he turns to his wife And he says, have I been a good man? Have I lived a good life? In that moment, he was reflecting on the price that had been paid for his life. The sacrifice that had been made for his freedom. And he started to think about it from the standpoint that how have I paid that back? How have I earned the sacrifice that was made for me? Even talking about it now, I get teary-eyed. Just, it's such a powerful scene. But as I think about my faith also, I remember all that God has done for each and every one of us. For me, God created life. God created everything that we see. And he created his son, Jesus Christ, who went to the cross and paid the ultimate sacrifice there for us as well. And as I was thinking about how do we pay that forward, how do we earn that, how do we recognize what Christ has done, the passage from Second Peter, a little piece of that spoke to me. And um, Peter was helping us to understand how we, how, we earn, how we honor that sacrifice that's been made. And listen to these words again. It says, For this very reason, make every effort to add to your faith goodness, and to goodness knowledge, and to knowledge self-control, and to self-control perseverance, and to perseverance godliness, and to godliness mutual affection, and to mutual affection 
love. For if you possess these qualities in increasing measure, they will keep you from being ineffective and unproductive in your knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. They will keep you from being ineffective and unproductive. When I think about those that have come before me, that have paved the way and made it possible for my freedom, for the abilities that I've, I've been able to have in life and all of us have been able to have, I do reflect and think, have I been effective? Have I been productive? Have I honored those things that have been done before? And I, I can imagine the, the same questions being asked as the man standing at the grave uh, with his wife saying, have I been ineffective? Have I been unproductive? Um, seeking to know, have I honored what has been done for me? See, in asking these questions and really reflecting upon the fact that who we are and where we are has been paid for with a price, it's important that um, we remember what Jesus, someone who died in the line of duty, did for us and what he taught us and trying to be a better person as a result of it. But it's not just about us. It's about how we pay this forward. As Christians, we make disciples for Jesus Christ. One of the ways we intentionally go about making disciples in the church uh, is through confirmation, which is another reason we are gathered here this morning. This year, we as a church have worked and prayed together to nurture the faith of our confirmation class. The result of that effort is the personal faith decision that they have come to proclaim before all of us today. While our prayers and efforts played a part in their decision, ultimately it was through the movement of the Holy Spirit that each of them came to the realization that Jesus Christ is their Lord and Savior. This is the same Holy Spirit that moved through the disciples and crowds on Pentecost. On the confirmation retreat, we discussed how communion actually was like confirmation for the disciples. Jesus gathered together with all his disciples in the upper room because he was about to leave. He knew that he was going to be leaving them and he was passing the torch along to them. Just as our confirmands have been nurtured and guided along the way, today is the first day of their faith journey because it becomes their own. Just as in the upper room on that, uh, that Holy Supper, the, the disciples from that day forward were going to be on their own. But it was at Pentecost that they came into the full understanding of the part they, they would play in God's plan. See, it was at Pentecost, as I described in the story, I know it was a long passage, but the Holy Spirit came like tongues of fire and touched each and every one of them to the point that all barriers were eliminated. There were no language barriers anymore. Everyone was brought into the story. Everyone was welcome. Why? Because the Spirit came into the place. We live in a day and age where sometimes when we talk about religion, there's so much division that takes place and animosity and arguments and everything else. But we look at the story of Pentecost when the Holy Spirit shows up and all that stuff is gone. Everybody is brought in. Everyone is connected and everyone is a part of the conversation and seeking to understand and know more. And then Peter comes in, and he shares the sermon that God has laid on his heart. Now, I keep looking at scriptures, and I don't see any place where Peter prepared for this sermon. And I would love to have that gift, um, <laughs> where it just God lays it on your heart, and you just say it. It would eliminate so much preparation time in advance and everything else. You get more sleep the night before and just lay it on God. What an awesome thing. But Peter preached an amazing sermon, and he shared who Jesus Christ was with everyone there. And as a result, 3,000 people that day came to Christ and gave their hearts to God. And that was the birth of the church. That was the birth and the life of the body of Christ taking shape. And I love 
what it said. Because it's the same thing uh, that is happening with our confirmation class and that should be happening in the life of our church. Listen to the fruit of what happened that day. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their numbers daily those who were being saved. See, that moment at Pentecost wasn't a graduation like, okay, checked it off, we're done. It was the start of a new life. And you could see that played out. They gathered together for fellowship. They gathered together for worship. They broke bread together. They continued to care for their community and everything else. Something new had begun in each and every one of their hearts. That's what confirmation is. It's not the end of a process. It's the beginning of a journey. And seeing the fruits of that lived out in our confirmands is going to be a blessing But the confirmants need to see it lived out in each and every one of us as well. At Pentecost, the body of Christ was born. And today, confirmants, you are born into God's holy family. And following the Great Commission, all of us, we are not only to live this way, we are to teach others how to live this way as well as disciples. So what we do today through confirmation is allow the Holy Spirit to rest upon you, to give you the opportunity to proclaim your faith, and give you this this day as the beginning of the rest of your faith journey together. And one thing I want you to think about, everything that's been shared with you through teaching and everything else throughout this year, and everything all of you gathered today have heard, listen to this. On the night of Jesus' birth, many wonderful things were shared with Mary concerning Jesus. And scripture says that she stored all these things up in her heart and she pondered them. I ask you to do the same with all you have learned through confirmation so that you may become God-bearers. During the confirmation retreat, they learned a a fun Greek word. It's theotokos. Theotokos. And what that means is God bearer, someone who bears God. This was the name given to Mary. She was known as Theotokos. So they learned a fun Greek word. It'll be cool. They could share it in parties, stuff like that. But more importantly, it's a reminder that as a Christian, as a disciple, they become God bearers just as all of us are God bearers. And I ask that as God bearers, that you pass on what you have learned to others so that they too may be blessed. So I'm going to try and sum it all up, see how it goes. Today we remember the servicemen and women who paid the ultimate price for our freedom. We also remember that Jesus Christ in the line of duty paid the ultimate sacrifice for our lives. But through the Holy Spirit, death did not have the final victory. On Pentecost, the same Holy Spirit gave birth to the body of Christ and sent the church to make disciples for Christ. Today, that same Spirit is at work in us as we bless and welcome these confirmands born into the family of God. Amen? Amen.